This is Control Structure, episode 124 for March 14th, 2017. Big week to everyone listening. The show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs124 to see them. I am your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. Podcasting. Podcasting never changes. But I really wish it would. The number goes up every show. Well, yeah, but... I mean, that... that The number itself changes, but the number going up... The fact that the number goes up never changes. Hmm. You could do, like, a special April, April 1st one and do, like, a negative, you know, Ooh. 125 or something. Ooh, that'd be good. Or... Or negative whatever episode at the Nexus is at, or something. There you go. Or totally do a joke podcast where the Fringe is the real show. Oh, that's actually a really good idea. I like that. Well, except I think Podkit already did that. But, oh, okay. Or, or may- maybe I forgot that like they they you know got together, discussed the show, then they actually did a show. Then I guess Ryan decided that the fringe that they had was actually a really good show and uh, did that for like the next time or something. Okay, so it wasn't intentional, it just kind of happened. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so you may notice that it's been a fortnight and a half or so since we did our last show. Um, that's because uh, we had another cookout with Chris and. Uh, Zach and like other people other people uh, yeah Matt didn't come so it was just yeah me you Chris and uh, Zach so I was the other people I guess <laughs> how, how, how does that make you feel to be the other people it means there's more than one of me so that feels <laughs> pretty good yay <laughs> and apparently I'm I'm your Steven so <laughs> I, so I have an owner I guess <laughs> well uh well, maybe not quite an owner, owner, but like uh, you know, you you're more my friend than Chris's, maybe. <laughs> yes, I, I I would I would agree with that <laughs> statement. <laughs> yeah, you're you're just an acquaintance to him. Uh, so yeah, so because Chris decided that since his mom is a valid, that uh, you know she can look after herself and stuff, that. Uh, he doesn't need to be around her as much anymore, so now he wants to, you know, come over and stuff, and it seems like Tuesday is always the day to do that. I, I think he's always hoping that I'll be there, but somehow I, I sometimes get the feeling he hasn't figured out the two-week schedule yet. He must not have. You know, like, <laughs> I keep I keep telling him, and for a while there, he wanted to meet up on the other Tuesday. <laughs> oh, he's under our good. Yeah, See, I've, I've been texted by him before. He's like, you coming Tuesday? I'm like, no, I'll be the next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So get with the program, Chris. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, but that really doesn't bother me because then we do the podcast the other Tuesday. So Yes, because if we were always the head of the party, we'd never get the podcast done. So, <laughs> so uh Anyways, uh, I had the last of the chicken wings tonight, and I think Those I st- are good. I think I still have like another serving or two of the casserole, and that's it. So, uh, yeah, I've also been trying to intersperse with salad. So, yeah, that, that, that's a good thing. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, been been keeping on using the bike. So with the uh, the keyboard there. I, I saw your setup there the other day when I went down to get your charcoal. I, I walked by the bike and I saw you had your keyboard on it and uh, looked quite handy there for typing and such as you're, you're cycling well, along. Well, you see, you know, the monitor is down there. So, like, I eventually figured out that I could, like, watch DVDs and stuff down here. And then I realized, hey, um, you're binging a lot on YouTube. Why don't you do that at the same time as you bike? So, you know, instead of, like, going over things that you've watched before, watch something new all the time. You know, something that you would watch anyway. So, uh, then I'm like, okay, yeah. And But uh, then the problem of control came up. And, unfortunately, I couldn't exactly find, like, a plug-in to Chromium that would allow you to control YouTube with a controller. 
or something. So I actually had have a full size keyboard like down there on the handlebars to uh, like close tabs and stuff. So, as long as it doesn't fall off, that works. Um, I have it balanced uh, ideally. So okay, yeah, I I, I have it just so. Uh, you know, so like what I normally do is like before I get on, like I open up tabs of YouTube videos to like queue them all up, and then then I just start closing tabs when they finish. There you go. So that's not too too hard to drive then. Or uh, or sometimes like I'll just like load up a playlist or something, but it still helps to like pause every once in a while. So you know, just need the space bar there. So yeah, it I have a system down there. It works so uh, that's good because that like you said the youtube videos you're gonna do it anyways so you can get your exercise in at the same time yeah and i kind of enjoy like watching the uh, star citizen videos because like you know it has you know it's essentially you know the spaceship game so like it, if it shows footage of like you going through space you have like you know not just like the feeling of being in space just like visuals of things moving past you that's that is ideal when you're on a bike to give you the feeling like you're moving yeah so and then uh you also notice the fan on the dryer i actually did not notice the fan on the dryer yeah like just a normal box fan that you see in windows and stuff so so this gives you further promotes the feeling that you're going someplace well I, I that's your... that's that's the secondary purpose of it uh, the primary purpose of it is I'm sitting there biking, I'm, you know, working up a sweat, and I'm getting hot. I want to cool down. And it usually doesn't help that the furnace is running, like, right there next to me. <laughs> so you're being rested out, too. Okay. So, like, turn turn it on, you know, like, even, like, a low or medium, and I'm cool. So, anyways, uh, how have you been? I've been quite well uh enjoying the nice cold weather the blower motor on the heater of my trailer broke last week so it was like kind of warm then like the 40s and 50s like ah that's not too bad and then like today was really cold yeah so i've got, had a uh a, one of those electric oil heater things out there underneath my desk and like a heat blanket and a winter coat on <laughs> and gloves that have the you know those mitching gloves that that fold back to let your fingers be exposed to, uh-huh. So you can stub your fingers out so you can type. Yeah, I've been wearing those. So it is currently about 35 degrees. It was like 21 this morning. Yeah. Or 23 or something. Yeah. So, so good news, though, the blower fan came in the mail today. So I just have to uh, dissect the rest of the furnace, put it in, then put the furnace back in, and hope it all works. So, uh, oh, so remember at church we have the projector uh, there, and I do remember that? And uh, then the laptop beside it. Mm-hmm. So apparently that laptop is really crappy because I got it on Newegg about five years ago for about four hundred dollars. Yeah, that that would that would do it. Uh, like it can do seven twenty p okay, but not ten eighty p. It kind of like skips frames. <laughs> so uh, like. A few months ago, Pastor told me, hey, uh, can you upgrade these? So I was like, okay, I'll see what I can find. And then I didn't really do anything for like two months. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, crap, I should probably get on this. And uh, so I was just, you know, browsing around, you know, switching back and forth between Newegg and uh, Amazon. Wanted a laptop that had a 1080p screen, 15 and a half inches, uh, with a SSD and like some uh, not low end Intel chip, like maybe an i5 or something. Yeah. For like, how should I say this? I wanted to get two of them, uh, budget a thousand to fifteen hundred total. Uh, so I'm like, okay, this should be workable. So I'm yeah. like, you know, sp- I spent an hour, you know, fiddling around with filters and stuff, and you know. Pretty much what I wanted was out of the price range. So, like, $1,500 max means, like, no more than $750 per laptop. So, uh, you know, I really couldn't do that. And then, 
you know, I was just clicking around and ended up on the Amazon uh, bestseller list uh, for laptops. And then I think it was like number five or something was exactly what I wanted for like 600 bucks. And I'm like, I'm an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) You know, like I've wasted an hour and it was just like here in an easy, accessible place the whole time. So, uh, yeah, I guess props to Amazon for that. I guess Uh, there's a reason why I was on the bestseller list. Yeah, you know... As a fast-talking Australian game reviewer once said, sometimes popular things are popular for a reason. And that came in the mail today. It is still mostly in the box. I've I've, I've opened the box, but not completely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Enough to make sure there's not bricks in there. Yes, let's just say that. Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! Can't yell quite so loud today. <laughs> well, there's still no one next door, so... Yeah, well, I don't want to wake people up now. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're. are you in the house now? Yes, I'm in the house okay. now. Ooh, how luxurious. It is luxurious. The room to myself, two monitors, that their loud mechanical keyboard. <laughs> So, uh, what's going on in the Raspberry world? Oh, so there is a new Pi Zero, and this one actually comes with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth for only $10. So, uh, Bluetooth. Good. What's that? We have Bluetooth. I forgot about that. Yep. Well, Bluetooth. Bluetooth. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's not bad for $10. You get the, the Wi-Fi on it. And then your your blue toot for random serial type of applications could be really great if you want to control uh, something over a serial port. That could be kind of useful. For that I could see that being useful. Uh, yeah, not bad though. But uh, that purchases the chip. I believe the chip is uh, what eight dollars. And the chips I've found are nice, but I kind of like the whole idea of swapping an SD card in and out. Right. So that might make the Raspberry Pi a bit of a win from that perspective. So, let's see. It's, you know, just like a normal 1 gigahertz single core CPU. So, uh, I guess this is more of a souped up model one then? Which, if you think about a Raspberry Pi 1 though, if you're using like more of an embedded application, thinking like my garage door opener, right. I seriously do quad core on my garage door. That's just not what it needs. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you know it has to actuate all of those like little doors there. So, so much thinking to go into <laughs> that. <laughs> so I was I was looking at this photo here of it, and it looks like it doesn't have the header pins on it, but I'm seeing holes there. So it looks to me like you could stuff a wire up through there and solder something onto it if you wanted to. I'm, I'm exactly. guessing. Exactly. Uh... So that. Or just, like, put in, like, a row of pins or something. I'm a little disappointed that they wouldn't put the header pin on, but maybe they're thinking space, and if that's the constraint, then, yeah, I guess it's going to be easier to solder something on there in less space. Exactly. Uh, That would be nice if they sold maybe two versions. I guess it's easy. Converting would be easy as buying a header pin and just soldering it on, too. It's not really a big deal. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we also have a review of the Asus Tinkerboard, uh, you know, the, uh, the one thing that we saw, <laughs> YouTube ads, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, this is a, uh, more of it in a video form, so, you know, this guy has ordered, uh, one of these Tinkerboard things, and, uh, yeah, apparently it does actually, uh, fit in, like, Raspberry Pi, uh, cases, so the uh, the thing that he sort of harps on at the end is the fact that, you know, sure, this is better hardware, but the thing that makes or breaks these small little embedded computers is the community and support behind it. Yes. And right now, like, there's hardly anything behind this tinkerboard. Mm. What are they priced at right now, do you know? Uh, I think they're still at their original price. Which is like the British price of like maybe sixty five pounds or so. Yeah, I feel like to do good at the embedded world, you're gonna have to be super super cheap. 
which is originally the Raspberry Pi concept. $35 when the Raspberry Pis first started coming out, like that blew our minds for $35. You could get a mini computer that actually could, like a mouse keyboard monitor could function as a web browser if you really wanted to do that. But now at this day and age, it's like, you have to be super cheap because you're, you're, you're looking at projects like that garage store. Like, I don't need a lot of dollars. I just need something cheap. So I'm looking at the, uh, you know, just searched uh, Amazon and Newegg, and uh, they don't have those there. So, yeah. Uh, so, and now for uh, this episode's LOL Amazon. <laughs> hey, speaking about Amazon, uh, you've heard of uh, their simple storage service, their S3 uh, for AWS, right? Uh, yes, I, I've, I've heard quite a bit about the AWS and uh, and their storage and things like that. Yeah, uh, you might recognize it because that's what the network's podcasts are stored in. So, uh, on February 28th, uh, there was a problem with uh, AWS, especially in their uh, U.S. East region, uh, where... Uh, Apparently, uh, debugging with uh, their billing system uh, uh, led to a few problems, and uh, one thing led to another, uh, which led to somebody fat-fingering a, uh, a script that pretty much knocked S3 offline. And, Best. and the- yeah, the, uh, their AW, the, I think, yes, yeah, so the U.S. East region is like their default region. And due to the fact that a lot of people like to use AWS for things, like this pretty much knocked, I wouldn't want to say completely, but probably at least somewhat knocked about half of the internet offline. What I found was interesting is it seemed like a lot of their systems used it. And so it's like some of them fed off of itself. Uh, the, the next one there that you're showing the... Yeah, this is this the, is amazing. Yeah, there's... <laughs> list of things that are up and down it's like well it, it uses some of the things that monitors so you know, whether it's up or down so yeah like uh for like all these cloud services and stuff like each one has their own uh like service status page so uh you know like i actually witnessed this like i went to the aws status page and it said everything was fine <laughs> But meanwhile, Hacker News is burning down because, you know, people are saying, yes, AWS is down. <laughs> like, it could barely handle, like, all the people, you know, just saying, yes, I can confirm this. Uh, whereas, you know, the AWS status page says everything's good. Everything's good. I see no problems. Uh, but then the uh, their Twitter account said that the dashboard is not changing color because it's related to the S3 issue. See the banner at the top of the dashboard for updates. So, yeah, apparently their dashboard for S3 was hosted on S3. So when it was having problems, this dashboard was having problems uh, displaying a red checkbox or something. So that sounds like a lesson learned about hosting your dashboard on the same same technology that it's monitoring well i i can sort of see the wisdom in doing that but like you need to make sure that things work <laughs> you know if if you have uh like maybe like a static page or something that gets generated like every few minutes or something yeah. or at least have something that you could i they kind of had the banner there but maybe i don't know have a fallback plan for it's really broken bad okay this to this other page up there and uh, at least let people know yeah. What I found interesting was they mentioned that one of their one, something with an index or something, uh, a server. They said they hadn't rebooted it for like years, and so it they had to reboot it though, and so it took a long time to come back online. But I, I found it interesting that it's currently been that reliable for this long that yes. yeah, it just never had to reboot it. So All that's, right, that's so, impressive. Uh, by twelve twenty six p.m. Pacific time, the index subsystem had activated enough capacity to begin servicing S3 get list and delete requests. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, oh, yeah. So other services uh, in the region that rely on S3 for storage, including the S3 console, Elastic Compute Cloud, new instance launches, the Elastic Block Store volumes, 
uh, when data was needed from a snapshot in AWS Lambda were also impacted. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, one of the inputs of the command was entered incorrectly and a larger set of servers was removed than intended. Uh, the servers that were inadvertently removed supported two other S3 subsystems. One of these, the index subsystem, manages the metadata and location information of all S3 objects in the region. This subsystem was necessary to serve all get, list, put, and delete requests. Uh, the second subsystem, the placement subsystem, manages allocation of new storage and requires the index subsystem to be functioning properly to correctly operate. So, it sounds like they completely hosed themselves. Yeah. It's interesting. It sounds like a lot of their system is built on their own system, so it's like it really depends upon itself to function. Uh, except, apparently, the Amazon storefront. You gotta keep that online. You can't let that go down. Yeah, like a surprising, surprisingly little of the actual Amazon storefront is hosted on the AWS stuff. Uh, that so rather funny. I mean, that's top priority, guys. You can't let that go down. So uh, because of this, they're making changes to said script and, like, the whole system. Uh, you know, while... Removal of capacity is a key operational practice. In this instance, the tool used too much capac the tool used allowed too much capacity to be removed too quickly. We have modified this tool to remove capacity slower and added safeguards to prevent capacity from being removed when it will take any subsystem below its minimum required capacity level. So, um I'm not sure if anyone got fired over this, but uh <laughs> But uh, I mean, that, you know, it th seems that sounds like the guy was just trying to do his job. It says he ran it from a playbook that they had. Yeah, he just messed up the number. So... Yes, so it sounds like it was a uh, not a bin bash error, but a bin human error. Yes. Uh, so this one uh, might interest you. The next uh, topic there. Ah, the pocket. I, I take it you've uh, known of my use of pocket. You've, so, you've uh, dropped uh, hints here and there. Dropped, dropped hints. Ah, I think I have mentioned a few times. Yes, I, I do use Pocket. It's pretty handy because uh, if you're on a web page or something, you can save it to it and then come back later if you have no data or, uh, you know, for whatever reason, just offline, don't want to burn data. Uh, other cool thing with it is it'll actually read to you so you can save it. And I, I've done this before. I, I think this is probably why I dropped the hints with the uh, extra large podcast article. I save it and then I uh, listen to it if I'm driving someplace or if I'm at work. It's a nice way to save an article so that you can find it later at home but not read it at work. So that's it, it makes sense that they acquire it to me because I've seen Firefox be very integrated with Pocket. It seems like they're very buddy already. So that makes sense. I don't understand how Firefox is going to use it, though. Mozilla, rather, is going to use it to... Uh, change what they're doing they must want some technology there or something yeah so if you recall like i think i think you might have noticed it like were you using it before it got integrated into firefox i don't think so yeah so at some point like they realized that oh a lot of people are using this so why don't we do everyone like the the favor of like not forcing people to install something and just like load it in with the normal browser. So like a lot of people were uh, sort of angry at this, but uh, you know, it, I guess was sort of free publicity. Uh, they eventually took it out though. Uh, but apparently they still had a good working relationship. So yeah, I guess they, uh, they bought uh, pocket because of that. And it seems like, uh, they're, they might be open sourcing this. Oh, that would be kind of neat, and you can see how it works. Yeah. So, or like maybe even host an instance of it yourself or something. Mm. Oh, that's true. So, yeah, it seems like you know that's a uh, you know good direction if that's the case. Uh, so, speaking about Firefox, Firefox version fifty two was released with WebAssembly and CSS Grid support. Uh, so. Uh, WebAssembly is like essentially uh, like bytecode, uh, but like uh, it's yeah, it is bytecode, but it sort of like 
replaces or like lives alongside JavaScript in the browser. Um, so uh, uh, per the Mozilla Developer Network, it is a new type of code that can be run in modern web browsers and provides new features and major gains in performance. It is not primarily intended to be written by hand. Rather, it is designed to be an effective compilation target for low-level source languages like C, C++, Rust, etc. Interesting. So they're really bringing real programming to the web. So, uh, well, we are kind of already had that with JavaScript. Kind uh, of. There's or, a lot of haters of JavaScript, though. Or, or at least once people figured out how to use JavaScript. <laughs> so It's true. Uh, oh yeah, and then Chrome got released, and suddenly uh, JavaScript performance became a thing to be had. Uh, so uh, Cloudflare, uh, let's see, I don't think we've really talked much about them. Uh, Cloudflare is essentially a fancy uh, content distribution network. Uh, so Cloudflare has uh, had a nasty bug for a while uh, that recently got fixed. Thank goodness. Uh, that would essentially leak uh, contents of uninitialized memory. So sort of like a buffer overflow, but it just kept on reading things after a while. Uh, it does not appear that like any of the private HTTPS keys have you know been leaked out because of this, because I guess like uh, it resides on different servers, I guess. Mm. Uh, but you know this is sort of reminiscent of Heartbleed uh, from a while back. Uh, but, uh, like the thing about this is, is that, you know, personal information and stuff, um, has been leaked out and is probably f still floating around in the Google cache because of that. Yeah, there was one thing I noticed when I read the article there, they gave the range of time when it was the most worst time for the issues, but then they're talking about Google cache and like, wait a second, that means it's still there probably. <laughs> it might be there forever. Yeah. Uh, or maybe uh, archive.org has some. Who knows? Mm -hmm. For sure. So, yeah. Uh, Windows 10, uh, uh, what I am running right now, uh, has recently started promoting things in a more ag aggressive way. I noticed OneDrive ads uh, in the OneDrive sync folder, you know, essentially saying, oh, pay X amount and have, like, a thousand terabytes for a year or something. Uh, so... So what was the tip-off that made you realize it was an ad? Uh, because uh, Explorer had never told me anything like that before. I was trying to get you to say what the article says about the dollar sign. <laughs> well, well, yeah, that too. I thought that was pretty clever. Yeah, like no other program has ever like put a message like that in uh, you know any kind of folder or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, there's apparently, if you go into folder options, uh, you can uncheck something, uh, called show sync provider notifications. Gotta love that folders view. That's like the, the best screen ever. You learn it when you're like way back at Windows 98 and you needed to show the hidden files and folders. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's like one of the very first things I do on a fresh Windows installation. Oh, yeah. And I've been doing that for at least the past 15 years. It's such a hidden setting. You think that they'd actually make it easy to find it because I bet everyone does that that knows what the, it is. The thing, the thing that bugs me the most is that it doesn't even honor these settings some of the time. Like mm. the, uh, uh, yeah, the uh, apply this view such as details or icons to all folders of this type, and like I'll you know hit apply to all folders. But it's only folders of that type. I want no, no, no. I want this view to be everywhere, no matter what you think is in there. But you know, even then, like it still manages to revert back every so often. And I'm pretty sure that's not on the Windows update cycle. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm running Ubuntu. So yeah, at least you know Linux-based stuff. They kind of remember what you had. Because if you didn't, there's going to be mean people, like, screaming everywhere. <laughs> mean people screaming. <laughs> so, uh, you may have thought that uh, the delay in this show might have been uh, due to Ryzen being released. But no, that's not the case. But it did come out. Uh, so, 
the uh, the general conclusion, the consensus, is that it is indeed competitive with one thousand dollar Intel enthusiast chips. You know, like the extreme edition things. Yes. If not on outright performance, then certainly on value. Uh, however, gaming performance lags behind cheaper three hundred dollar or so uh, i seven seventy seven hundred K processors. Can you count the sevens in that? So, um, you know, of course, you know, all the fanboys have been attacking these, you know, from both sides, uh, you know, accusations of biased reviews and bribed reviewers, uh, you know, abound everywhere in the comments section, you know, because apparently everyone's been paid off and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everyone has their favorite company. (laughs) Yes. It's like Ford and Dodge. Uh, but, uh, you know, in my YouTube binging, uh... I found a video that makes a kind of interesting point. Uh, to be more accurate, it is not that great in today's games, but it will be better than today's Intel CPUs in the future as games get more multi-threaded, even beyond things like Vulkan and DirectX 12, just like Bulldozer did. So Bulldozer was like the five-year-old CPU from AMD that you know was released was you know that when released was, uh, you know, how should I say, objectively bad compared to, you know, other Intel chips on performance. But over the, uh, you know, next few years, hardly anybody noticed that Bulldozer actually became faster than its contemporary Intel CPUs. Just, was that... just because of the, uh, like, more multi-threaded uh, nature. So, yeah, this is like a 15-minute video, but, uh, and it doesn't really get to his point until, like, 10 minutes in or so. But, uh, yeah, I found that, uh, you know, found that a, you know, how to say, important point on that. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if they built for the future, I mean, that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, how should I say this? Uh... Like, he made this video in response to people benchmarking video games at low resolutions. Mm. Um, because, like, apparently a lot of people think that benchmarking at low resolution, you know, kind of stresses the CPU more than the GPU. Thus, you know, can be a, a leading indicator of uh, future game performance. But, you know, he kind of proves that that's not the case. And you just need to kind of, like, stop and notice it. That would make sense because you've just got more data to deal with, more things to deal with. So it would either be constant or more. Uh, Let's move on and deprecate emoji. I'm not sure if I've mentioned this before, uh, but, you know, if you have a text box on the internet, eventually some special snowflake out there will put some emoji into it, and one morning you will wake up to your backend systems on fire because someone wanted to be cute and spell their name with a smiling pile of poop emoji. Uh, are your backend systems jealous that someone else has named that? So, uh... This has happened a few times on uh, at work on my, you know, the cl- the client's websites that, you know, someone puts in emoji and then it gets exported out the back and then like goes off to the order management systems and it blows up saying, what is this XML character? I don't even and <laughs> decides to reject that uh, that file with like all the other customer orders and then you're left wondering what in the world's happened, what in the world's going on here. So uh, the framework that we're using, you know, allows you to apply regex to uh, input fields. So pretty much use that liberally. You know, even if it's essentially a, you know, like these range of characters and then star. You know, that's pretty much all you need to do to, you know, eliminate emoji. Sanitizing inputs are always a good thing. I'm just thinking the XKCD about the the, the Robert tables. Names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Drop tables. <laughs> yeah. That's um, weird. Yeah, but this is uh, how should I say this? 
at least at least in my case that the problem comes when you export to XML because I guess uh, like the emoji support isn't that great or something uh, in the uh, XML library that my uh, company's you know servers use. Okay. Uh, but you know, then again, if you're running an order management system, uh, emoji are kind of irrelevant for that purpose. Yeah. So to me, it was it was kind of weird that some backend uh, like framework or something is not dealing with characters that too. If it's just like serializing, deserializing XML, is that the, what what was going on there? Uh, something like that, yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, XML can be painful though sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. So my advice is pretty much everything on the Unicode basic multilingual plane. And that should pretty much cover most writing systems of the world. So, so I, what have you done? So I have, uh, on, uh, at work, we have a media wiki instance that I manage that we do, like, internal uh, documentation and stuff on. Anyways, I updated it to version 1.28 the other day. And it was all cool because there's going to, you know, new updates to the visual editor, things like that. And uh, the backend Tersoid service just broke on it. So uh, I had a fun time with that fixing. It turned out there is a, a really small missing comment in the config file. There's like one dash, because this uses YAML. And there's like one dash that was commented. And that had it down for like a whole week. So yeah, that was my feat was finding that one dash that then now works. Anyways, uh, I've been really impressed with MediaWiki though. Every time I work with it, it seems like they put a lot of work into their products and as far as like making them separate and uh, extensible, it's, it's kind of fun seeing what they do with those things. Well, then again, it does run Wikipedia, so... It does. They're, they're very impressive what they do. I was looking because uh, I wanted to see what version of Visual Editor and MediaWiki the Wikipedia runs. And they weren't even on like their stable version. They're like on one of the hot, like almost just got built versions. <laughs> I was like, wow, so you're running your production site on like a really cutting edge version. And apparently they have tests or whatever they do. And they're able to do that. And I- I've heard they use like Vagrant and lots of VMs and somehow they can share the load. Yeah. But however they're achieving that, it's, it's pretty impressive uh, that they're they're willing to run like the latest and the greatest like that they're not out there on big version updates they're probably constantly updating i imagine yeah so um yeah i guess that's pretty much it for the uh the news articles of the podcast uh but if you'd like to submit any kind of feedback to the show go ahead and do so on the nexus.tv and you can do so right there on the show notes page uh and don't forget that today is international backup awareness day so um I guess don't back up your emoji, though. <laughs> Those will just be there. Um, so uh, I did enter into that uh, contest, uh, the grilling contest yes. for the uh, uh, the casserole. Uh, so that should be appearing on TriggerGrills.com, uh, maybe. So uh, they got 123 recipes. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty decent chance for you, then. Uh, which, uh, how should I say, before the weekend, there was, like, maybe 30. So, I guess people got, you know, got their, uh, business together there. Mm. Uh, so they really want to have two brackets. Uh, so, like, that's 64 each bracket. So they're, okay. they're kind of doing, like, a March Madness kind of thing. Except yeah. it's Meat Madness. Ha <laughs> so, ha, So I guess they're going to, you know, like, get together... Like maybe some of the employees' recipes and throw in there too, so. Uh, and members work for them. Yeah, I think the first the first round will be on Thursday, so go there and uh, go to Trigger Grills, Meat Madness, and I'll probably be somewhere in the bracket. You have to uh, put it in the show notes yeah. here so we can find it with uh, with my Cajun casserole. Um, so. Uh, let's see. There's that, and uh, I, as mentioned in the uh, fringe, I finished Fallout 4. Uh, so I'm got 
uh, sort of large post uh, already written up, but I want to polish it some more and grab some screenshots and, uh, yeah, be putting that up there. And I will probably be putting up a, uh, a post about the emoji stuff uh, as soon as my blog is compliant with that. <laughs> that way you don't have someone testing it. Yeah, uh, because uh, lo and behold, my uh, backups of the blog uh, use XML. Uh, so I pretty much just make a huge uh, RSS feed, uh, which, you know, RSS is a uh, schema of XML. Mm-hmm. So, so, uh, so if I leave comments in your blog, though, like I give like a you know nice job smiley face, I really don't want you deleting my smiley face when you restore your backup. Yeah. So, um, just just to use old fashioned uh, emoji, you know, with the uh, the colons and the parentheses. Okay. You know, just do do them old school. You know, get off my lawn. <laughs> so um uh let's see then yet yeah, chris will be coming over tomorrow uh, along with maybe some other people have fun yep and uh, i guess you will be freezing out in your trailer i will be freezing out in my trailer so uh anything else to add nope i think that's about it all right so have a good one you too